Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you uh, at the outset to Dr. Malika for this opportunity. I'm going to be talking about acquired retinoschisis related RDs, which necessarily might not be complicated, but they're but but they're different. They need to one they need to be <coughs> diagnosed properly and then have a bit of a variation in the management. And I'll be soon showing a few cases. So when you talk about retinoschisis and typically non-tractional retinoschisis, you know you have your X-linked or your congenital retinoschisis, but you also have the senile. The, the main difference between that and the more common, uh, you know, and the XLRS, the commoner variety of these senile retinoschisis is that the, that the split is in the relatively outer retina. It's in the outer plexiform layer. However, there is a rarer subtype of the senile or the acquired retinoschisis, which is bullous to look at, but it's called reticular because the split is, is, is more superficial in the same layer as is in the X-linked retinoschisis. And because the split is in the inner layer, it tends to be more bullous. Uh, it's not as rare as one might think. There is hardly any data from pigmented races, right? You, most of this data comes from landmark one, uh, you know, work done in the mid 80s by Dr. Bayer. He, you know, he's the one who actually actually told us about whether you want to laser asymptomatic lattices or not, and you know all of that. So he followed up these patients, and the prevalence is seven percent in patients over 40 years of age in Caucasians, which is much more than than that of lattice degeneration which all of us retina specialists diagnose every, you know, left, right, center every single day. But uh, somehow these patients tend not to be picked up either because of A, ignorance, B, lack of understanding, or, and C, just because these are generally a lot less associated with retinal detachment. The chances that they will progress to detachment are, are lower, and patients, despite having a bullous elevation in the peripheral retina, remain asymptomatic until they get the, you know, retinal detachment. You know, it looks, you know, uh, similar. It's, it, you know, it is, it is, it is, it can be shallow or elevated depending on one of, on, on one of, one of these two varieties. It, because it's retinoschisis, you can have the hold in the inner layer or multiple holes in the outer layer. There is difference in the holes of the inner and outer, uh, outer layers. The outer layer holes are much more prominent looking. They are bigger, they are lesser in number, and they're typically, they look like large holes, which you will see generally full thickness holes in the retina. The inner layer holes almost resemble sieve-like retina. They're easy to miss on a cursory examination. They are generally multiple. The inner layer tends to be thinner. And only when the outer and inner layer holes are present in, over the same area and there is a flow for the vitreous to get from the vitreous cavity into one of the sheets and then into the subretinal space will you get the regmatogenous RD in this, right? So the issues and why we want to be, so this is one entity we can't change. This is, this is, you, this is what you get. You know, people with microcystoid degeneration can get it. We can manage the complication and the complication is retinal detachment. There are two kinds. One is the schesis detachment. And this is a photo which is right there, a representative photo that I've taken. It almost looks like this has been barraged off. This hasn't. So typically, as you would see in chronic retinal detachments, that the body would try and limit the detachment. There'll be RPE changes and there'd be a demarcation line. We generally see it semicircular or arc-like because retinal detachments tend, tend to be like that. A schesis detachment is you have multiple outer layer holes the, in, the layer of the, in the area of the schesis. And because of that, there is retinal detachment in the layer of the schesis, but it's not beyond it and it stays there for a very, very, very long time. So it's a localized round retinal detachment and all around 360 degree, there will be pigmentation. It's very similar, the phenomenon being similar to what you have as a demarcation line. And these progress extremely slowly, if ever, to retinal detachment and require observation. What we want to intervene for and the stage that, and the cases that I'll be showing are of the second variety, which is the progressive regmatogenous RD. Again, very rare, 0.05%. And typically, if you, as I, as I mentioned previously, you need for the vitreous to be able to get into the retina, into the sclesis below the retina, and then it's gonna happen. So you need an inner layer break, you need an outer layer break, you need those breaks to be aligned for the fluid to be able to go in, and then it's going to actually progress from a schesis RD into a progressive retinal detachment. I'm going to sh be showing four represent representative cases quickly. One will have a video. Uh, this is the first one. This is a patient who actually came with sudden vision loss, you know, had a typical curtain-like effect. That's the ultra-wide field fundus photo of the right eye. Uh, that is an artifact. And you'll soon see uh, in the surgical video why that is not, and you'll also see, you know, why uh, large, uh, as I said earlier, the outer layer holes tend to be large, round, 
one, two, three, inner layer, and you can see the retinal vessels going over them, so you're very clear that this is schesis. You know, there, there's a sheet of retina over it. Inner layer holes are hardly seen there. This patient was planned for a combined buccal weight, and this is what we did. The idea is to, yeah, so this is, uh, you know, me tying the 240 band, and then uh, I moved on to the vitrectomy part of it, 25 gauge three port standard vitrectomy, which is my go-to vitrectomy for all cases. The idea to show this is the surgery is not any different from a lot of other detachments, but the intra-op video uh, after the uh, hyaloid removal, which will be, uh, you know, canacot assisted will be shown uh, just shortly. Uh, the, the video will show the inner layer and the outer layer breaks and the anatomy a lot better. So again, as is paramount for any detachment case, the hyaloid has to come off. Uh, I think that's not going to change no matter what the etiology or variety of the retinal detachment. And right there you can see that, uh, you know, those are your round, large outer retinal breaks. One, the cutter is going to soon, soon kind of rotate, yeah, show, show it uh, like that. Two and three, and which was also seen on the ultra wide field photo, you'll soon see some of the inner, 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 finer inner retinal breaks also on top of them. If you could, if you could notice right on top, there are certain ones there as well. They weren't very well seen. Uh, they, they were seen well on the uh, clinical exam. They weren't very well seen there. And those, and those inner retinal breaks are actually there over those outer retinal breaks. And hence the conduit, what you got, there was also some hemorrhage in the periphery. That, that, that white area right there is the, uh, uh, you know, uh, kind of the second thing that you saw on the photo. That was the area of fibrosis. The rest of the surgery is fairly similar. You detach the hyaloid, you ensure that you've, you've you know, done what you've done. There was a, uh, you know, I thought a suspicious area uh, just posterior to that as well, which had a break. I actually removed that. Uh, I'm just going to quickly go forward. And after that, you do a fluid air exchange. Uh, the difference in what you want to do after... Uh, you know, uh, a first di diagnosing is is that again you you flatten all of this, and then to ensure that both the leaflets of the retinoschisis stick together, you laser all over them. You ensure that all of those two layers of retinoschisis stick to each other, and that primarily is because if this patient has a recurrence later on of either a retinal detachment or a retinoschisis, you would never know clinically as to what that is, uh, whether you would have to reintervene or not. So the idea is once you're inside the eye, you ensure that both the flaps are stuck together and not just to pexy to the outer and inner layer holes so that, you know, there is no recurrence of either schesis or detachment in that area. I, I, I finished this, 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 this case with gas and, you know, this lady did okay. Uh, this is another patient I'm showing similar. I'm sorry, this image is rotated a bit. I, I, I tried to correct it. It, uh, it wasn't happening. The upper temporal, uh, you know, retinoschisis. And you can very well see the difference in the area of the schesis and the detachment. So the area of the schesis is from there to there. It's smooth. It's more translucent. You can see the choroidal kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, vessels there a lot better. That is the tear right there. That's a full thickness horseshoe tear. And that is the area of the regmatogenous retinal detachment. It's opaque. It has corrugations. And that's what's caused the, uh, you know, patient to be symptomatic. I'm just finishing in one minute. And again, this patient was managed with vitrectomy. And that's what the outcome was. Again, barraged both the layers of the what, what was the schesis together. And hence those confluence scars. And this patient did well. Again, you know, operate this patient with uh, uh, wit, buckle, and uh, gas. This is another patient. And this is just basically to show that you know, you have these two areas. This part, that is the schesis part, and that is the progressive retinal detachment. That is the break right there. That's the blown up photo. It clearly shows that the part of the schesis right there is transparent. You can look at the core. You, you can make out the choroidal vessels a lot better, whereas the retinal, typically as you would have in retinal detachment, there is loss of retinal transparency. There are corrugations. And so that is the schesis part. And that is where this progressive RD has actually gone in. And the patient will only be symptomatic once the fluid gets in there. This patient was eventually just managed with a scleral buckle and did fine. And just one last case to show, uh, uh, you know, I, re I remember showing my fellow this and my fellow, you know, the previous case. And a month later, we, shot, we, we saw this one. And she said that, sir, ye bhi retinoschisis RD hai acquired wala. And again, you can see that this is, uh, that's the schesis part. And that there is the altered loss of transparency, the progressive retinal detachment. The patient's only going to get symptomatic once that happens. Again, so I said, you diagnosed it, buckle her. 
So she buckled her. It's a bit of a posterior buckle effect, but, uh, you know, because the brake was right there in the periphery. It did not need to be buckled that much. But I just wanted to show this because this is the most recent of the one that we had. She buckled this. The idea is you can, fixing these is not difficult. You can fix them with buckle or vitrectomy. The idea is diagnosing. And the, more, and the main important difference is not to go chasing, looking at the other eye. This is not X-linked retinoschisis. And you want to try and plaster both the uh, sheets together with laser so as to prevent any doubt whether it's a recurrence of RD post-op or recurrent of thesis post-op. Thank you. Thank you, Mohit, for the beautiful videos. I have two questions for you. One is, how would you manage the thesis where the RD is not due to the thesis, but you have a peripheral thesis with the inner or outer retinal holes? Yes, uh, so uh, the RD, I mean, I mean uh, the management would be, would be the same, uh, but I would also uh, still uh, want to flatten the uh, flatten both the laser of the skisis because I say I think more so in this scenario one would have a bigger dilemma in the post-op period whether it's remnant skisis or it's uh, a recurrence of the detachment so we'll never know for sure and we'll just be guessing post-op since we'll be inside the eye if I'm if 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 vitrect to me something that I'm planning I would want to would la clear laser all over it however it. if I'm buckling I would ignore that area I would just treat the area which has the break and treat that area per se. And secondly, how, like you said, really, if it's a schesis, you really did, there has to be inner retinal holes and you may not be able to identify. Right. So do you think it's important to spend time pre-op or intra-op with OCTs and all, or you just treat it like the entire area? Would so, you waste time on identifying holes? I think if you're doing vitrectomy, it might not be that, that prudent to do it, ma'am. But if, if one's planning buckling, and l l let's say for the first patient, which had la larger, uh, you know, outer retinal holes, multiple inner retinal holes, that was buckleable. That, but, but that would have been very challenging. How much do you cryo? What do you cryo? What not? So for those patients, if there is any doubt, I'd recommend vitrectomy. And in those patients, not looking at that, uh, you know, th that maybe closely pre-op. But if one is planning to do a buckle, then I think it's then paramount. Otherwise, there will be failure of surgery. Fair enough. Thank you. Sure. Sir. So, uh, uh, basically, you have planned for beer uh, not to go for the buckling, but in these cases where there is there are multiple inner retinal holes yeah. and the outer retinal holes maybe one or two, yeah. will you plan to do to do the superficial retinectomy overlying the skysis part? Uh, yeah, it's generally not needed, sir, because again, uh, different the 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 difference of this from X, X linked retinoschisis is that X-link, the, the split is in the nerve fiber layer. Yes. So the inner layer of these cases, which we generally remove, is, is two layers of the retina, and we have eight layers there. Now, the, the most commonest variety of this, which is 90% of the cases, the split is outer plexiform. So we have six inner retinal layers and four outer retinal layers. Now, if we were to remove, and this is just, I'm you're thinking out loud, if we were to remove six inner retinal layers, I think that would just amount to a very large retinectomy, in, and, and then all the complications of a re large retinectomy would ensue, which we don't see in XLRS because the outer retina, the eight layers are still intact. So, so I would typically not, sir. Now basically, if there are very one or two outer retinal holes and multiple inner retinal holes, so you cannot, it is very difficult to identify the inner retinal holes. Rather, identifying all the holes, you can do, just do that they are actually not uh, important for the peripheral field of vision. Sure. So you can just do the retina, superficial retinectomy, leave the outer retina and do the laser around the outer retina hole okay. so that your retina adjustment will not Or we could just stick, stick both these together. So it will not expose your RP much so no. that it will not increase the chance of PBR. Thick point. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.